continue our series this morning with a message entitled Godly Parenting and a Fallen World. Godly Parenting and a Fallen World. We're going to be looking at Judges chapter 13, uh, focusing on verses uh, 1 through 5, but looking at several places throughout this chapter in the beginning of chapter 14. But let me read for you Judges 13, 1 through 5. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. Now there was a certain man from Zerah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For a child should be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And we're going to begin talking about one of the most famous judges, and it's talked about in Sunday school and preached from pulpits and You've been in any church amount of time or even in schools, they've talked about him. His name is Samson. Samson is known for long hair, incredibly great strength, and a weakness for women. But before we dive in to Samson, we're first going to look at his parents. His parents were, uh, his, his mother was barren. Uh, his, they could not have children. But then in the midst of this, God comes to his mom and says, Look, you're going to have a child. But this child is not going to be any ordinary child. You need to not drink any strong drink, no wine, no alcohol whatsoever. And you are not, when he is born, to touch his head. A razor should never cut his hair. He cannot be around unclean, dead things. And he must never drink alcohol. This kid was going to be special. This kid was going to do something great for God, for God says he will begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Samson had a great call in his life, and as such, God said that from birth he would be a Nazarite. Someone dedicated to God through his actions, through his behavior, through his parents, to do God's work. And there's only one other person in the Bible that had that call placed upon them before they were born, and that is John the Baptist. It's a special calling when God places that upon parents and places that upon a child. Because know this, while Samson had to when he reached adulthood, made the decision to not cut his hair and not touch wine or alcohol and to stay pure. It was his parents who had to raise him to understand the importance of what that meant. Amen. It was his parents who had to teach him what God had said to them before he was ever born. We live in a messed up, broken world. Amen. We, our schools are inundated with drugs and drinking and uh, just abundance in terms of rebelliousness and bad behavior and rebelling against authority over them. Parents, teachers, uh, law enforcement, all those have been put in authority over us. There's re rebelliousness towards them, disrespect. There's pain and suffering through the rebellious behavior of children in our schools and our kids are affected. Amen. Our kids are tempted to behave in ways that they know are wrong because of the world that we live in. Across the America and throughout the world the very idea of this possibility that there's absolute morality, absolute truth, there's appalls individuals it makes them angry so much so that they lash out because no one wants to be told that their choice of what makes them feel good is wrong Amen. they take it personally as they should take it personally you call me fat I take it personally I know I'm fat I know I'm a glutton I know it's wrong don't call me fat <laughs> I take it personal right I don't 
like my sin pointed out to me. No one likes their sin pointed out to them. And so it's easier just to pretend like there is no absolute moral standard by which man is supposed to try and live. And if we look at Samson's parents, I believe that we can take with us some things as parents that we can apply to the lives of our children and our lives as we raise them and make choices for them so that they are raised in a fear and a knowledge of God, knowing His statutes, knowing His love, knowing His grace, knowing His expectations for their lives. Amen. The first thing that we can learn from Samson's parents is that they recognize their proximity to the enemy. The Philistines for 40 years had run roughshod over the Israelites. They had sinned. They had fallen into moral depravity once more. They were worshiping false gods again. Right? They were doing uh, all the things that God had told them not to do again. It's like this repeated cycle. And so God sends in the Philistines to exact judgment and brutality against the nation of Israel. The enemy was at the doorstep of this mother and this father when the promise came to their child. Judges 13.1 says again, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of of the Philistines for 40 years. I read an illustration this week as I was studying. A reporter was interviewing an old man who was in his hundreds. And the reporter asked him, what are you most proud of? And the man said, well, I don't have an enemy in the world. And the reporter said, well, that's beautiful. That's awesome. What an inspiration to all of us. And the man said, yep. I've outlived every last one of them. <laughs> he had the privilege of outliving his enemies, those who uh, were against him in his mind. Uh, he knew that he had outlived those people that he had marked as enemies. We're not so lucky. Our enemy is all around us at all times. Amen. He's on our doorstep. He's in our living rooms, he's in our schools, he's in our families, he's within the, our communities. He is always out there manipulating events and manipulating people to continue to separate God's people from him. We live in a world infiltrated by Satan, who is an enemy of God, and he is the enemy of God's people, of mankind. Amen. He uses moms and dads and he uses everyone and circumstances to derail our lives. And he loves to do that against our children. Amen. He's looking for parents who are asleep at the wheel. He's looking for parents who are complacent with their children's relationship with God. He's looking for parents who are fighting about how to raise their kids. He's looking for parents who have weak marriages. He's looking for parents who are in bad situations. So they're so distracted by those things that they are not paying attention to their children. Amen. Our world is so filled with distractions. We must recognize that the enemy is at our door. He's waiting, looking, manipulating opportunities to take advantage of our families, to hurt us, and to hurt our children. Amen. He's not a nice guy. He doesn't like us, and he hates your kids. Amen. He's not something to be trifled with. The Bible teaches us that we live in a fallen world that was corrupted by the sin of Adam. Romans chapter 8, 20 through 22 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing to be because of him who subjected it in hope, because this creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only was man affected, but creation was affected itself by the sin of Adam and Eve. Amen. Natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, disease, pestilence. Amen. All of that are a result of the fall 
of Adam and Eve. The disease and viruses and bacteria that harm and destroy cancer, all of those things are a result of the fall of Adam, from the sin that he committed. We live among fallen people who are corrupted by the sin of Adam. Romans 5.12 tells us, Therefore, just as though one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. Sin entered the world because of the choice of Adam to eat of the fruit. And it was spread to all men, and so all men must experience death. Amen. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made Centered. By nature, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we are selfish, self-centered, rebellious towards God. Humans are not good in and of themselves. Anyone that tells you that obviously is not paying attention to society. Amen. Our world is spiraling out of control in the last 25 years. It is exponentially plummeted down the slope of depravity. Yes. True. Our world is crumbling. From the family out. Amen. And it is affecting every aspect of our society. Amen. From the family to the president of the United States and the leaders of the world in our country. Amen. And because of the fallenness of man, man thinks evil, man speaks evil, and man acts upon evil. Evil. Mark 7, 20-23 tells us that he said what comes out of a man that defiles a man. For, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Amen. Man thinks evil, he speaks evil, and he acts upon that evil. And Satan knows exactly how to exploit the fallenness of our world and to exploit the fallenness of man. Amen. He's been doing it for thousands of years. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly how to tweak and hurt mankind to cause them to reject God, to get mad at God, to deny his existence. He knows exactly what he needs to do to hurt our family. He knows exactly how to manipulate events and manipulate people to hurt your children and my children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews. He knows how to do it and he does it on a daily basis. That's why divorce is skyrocketing. Amen. That's why suicides are off the charts. That's why murders are off the charts. That's why school shootings are eerily too close together because Satan has infiltrated our world and he knows exactly what needs to be done to cause mankind to implode. Amen. He convinces us that our moms and our dads and our siblings and our uncles and our aunts and our bosses and our teachers are the problem turns us our focus towards them. He uses sickness, he uses pain, he uses suffering, he uses natural disasters to ruin lives, to hurt families and destroy them. But make no mistake, our evil our, our enemy is not man and it's not this world. Our enemy is Satan himself. Amen. The apostle Paul makes that clear. He says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hopes of wickedness and the heavenly places. Satan and his demons manipulate people and events to accomplish what he desires and what he purposes. And when we know this, when we know that the enemy lays right outside our, door, our doors, and many times he sits right in our living room and right in our family room, he's right in our houses, he comes in to stuff our children bring off the street. Amen. He comes in through people we let in our homes. He comes in through your TV and through your radio and through your iPod. Now, you guys know me. I'm not super spiritual. I don't see demons everywhere. I, I don't. You guys know me for any amount of time. I'm not that person. But I can tell you that he uses those things to get control of our homes and our minds and our children. And we willingly allow it because we don't recognize how close we are to 
the enemy. Amen. He's in our back yards, waiting. He's right there to attack your children where they feel the safest, yep. yes. where you think they're okay. He's right there waiting to hurt them, to attack your family, to attack my family. And so to combat this evil, we must teach our children the fear of God, the word of God, and the love of God. Amen. Psalm 34, 11 tells us, come you children, listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. It's lacking in our society. We do not teach our children to fear God, and therefore they fear no man either. Amen. We don't teach them to respect God, and they don't respect man. They don't respect those that are 40 over them. A big problem in our society today is there is no fear of God. And that fear starts at home through a mother, a father, a grandparent who teaches them the importance of understanding the might, the majesty of God. I did a whole sermon not too long ago about the fear of God. I won't recap that and make you sit through it again. But just understand as parents and as those who are responsible for our children, we have a responsibility to teach our kids to fear God. It starts at home. Amen. Amen. Teaching our children to respect God and understand His power and His might. We must teach our children the Word of God. Yes. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11, God tells the people of Israel, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as a, a frontlet between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. The word of God that God gave the nation of Israel and it applies to you and I today to his word that he has given us. It needs to be in our mouths it needs to be in our hearts it needs to be written upon the door of our home and it needs to be written upon the doors of our community. Amen. Amen. That starts at home. Yes. Amen. That starts with our children. Yes. Teaching them the importance of God's word teaching the importance of God's standard, the importance of God's statutes. We ignore God in our homes and we wonder why our children are wild when they leave them. Amen. We ignore God's in our house and we wonder why our children walk out the door and they're disrespectful to their teachers and they're doing drugs and they're being rebellious before God. It's because we've not taught them the fear of God. We've not taught them the word of God and the importance of it. Amen. We whine and we complain and we see counselors and we take them to get help. And I'm not putting down those things. What I'm saying is we seek worldly answers to spiritual problems Amen. and we wonder why our world is falling apart. Amen. Amen. We like to blame everybody but ourselves. Amen. God, my family's dysfunctional. When's the last time you prayed with our spouse? When's the last time I took my spouse by the hand and prayed with her? When's the last time that I prayed with my children? Amen. When's the last time I prayed for my children? Amen. We must teach our kids the love of God. 1 John 4, 8 says, For God is love. And this love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We must teach our children that while they, can, that they are separated from God, that separation can be fixed by confessing Christ as Lord and Savior and by understanding his love, his grace, and his mercy towards us. But they must be taught that at home and they must see that lived at home and the lives of their parents and the lives of their grandparents, their nieces, their, I mean, their uncles, their aunts, they need to see it. Amen. Live in the lives, the love of God. Parents, your children see God the way they see you. Amen. If they see you as joking all the time and never taking anything seriously, that's how they'll see God. If they see you as angry all the time and punishing them at the slightest offense and coming down harsh and talking bad to them, that's how they'll see God. Amen. We must teach them God's love. That means we do correct them, but we correct them in love and not anger. Amen. 
We do show them right and wrong, but we do so in love and not hatred and bitterness and anger. We must teach our children the love of God. We must fight for our children in prayer. Amen. Mom and dad, grandparents, you have a responsibility to pray for your kids. Amen. Many times parents don't even take the time to pray for their children. Amen. And it's a sad state of affairs when parents will not even take the time to call out their kids' names in prayer. We must fight for our children because nobody else is going to fight for them. Right. We must be on our knees uh, interceding for them, crying out to God because nobody else is going to love your child like you love your child. Right. No one's going to fight for your child the way that a parent should fight for their child. Uh, we'll go and fight teachers for our child. But we'll go fight police officers for our child. We'll fight the system for our child. But we won't fight Satan for our child. Right. Amen. We won't get on our knees and battle the spiritual forces that are trying to destroy our children because we're lazy, because we're uh, uh, complacent. Amen. Because we just hope it'll work itself out. Amen. Well, I'll let my kids make their own choice. Yes, our kids have to make their own choices. But I can't expect them to make the right choice if I never take them to church. Mm. I can't expect them to make the right choice if I never live it in front of them. Amen. And we must pray and intercede on their behalf. Because when they leave your home, they are at the mercy of the world. And the enemy loves to use that to destroy them. Amen. And so we need to pray for God's protection of our children. We need to pray offensively. Amen. We need to pray that God will put good, godly people in their lives that will be witnesses and examples and be that uh, accountability that they need for our children. Amen. We need to pray defensively. We need to seek God to reveal to us when our children are up to no good, when they're doing wrong, that God will open our eyes and give us wisdom on how to handle it. Yes, amen. It was a joke in our family as a kid that we knew that we could not get away with anything with my mother. We knew because God might show it. <laughs> and uh, that is a true story that goes with that. My brother was working to skip school and go smoke pot under the bridge around the corner from our house and my mama had a dream that that's what he was going to do and so she confronted him and he didn't know what to do that she knew what he was going to do before he did it had no idea God showed her God will show you parents when your children are up to no good Amen. parents Seek God on behalf of your children. Pray defensively. That God will open your eyes and give you discernment. Because no one else is watching out for your kids. Amen. You cannot take that for granted and assume someone else will pray. Somebody else will watch out for them. Somebody else will defend them. You have to pray that when you're not with them, God will be the one that defends them. Amen. We need to pray intensely. We need to have passion for our children. We need to seek God, be driven to our knees for our children. And He's subverted our hearts. Yes, amen. For their protection. What spouse that God sends to their lives? Amen. Mm -hmm. Give them wisdom on who to look for as that significant other, that husband, that wife. Amen. Beseech God intensely and understand how important it is. Parenthood is serious business and it is not to be taken lightly. We must pray with our children and we must pray with our spouses. Amen. God put a husband and a wife in the home together for a reason and that is to raise good godly children and a fear and a knowledge of him. I came up in a single family, a single parent home for the most part. My dad did not know God at the beginning of my life, and he died a few months after he finally accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. My mama raised us from the time we were 10 on. 
And it was a struggle. It was tough. There were times when my dad would say, the kids aren't going with you to church tonight. They're staying home with me. Because he did not know and love God the way that mom knew and loved God. And so it was a battle in our home. It was a struggle. You could feel it sometimes. So moms and dads, God has given you the opportunity to work together and protect your children. If you are both Christians, don't fight and resist it. Accept it and know that together you can raise godly children for Him. Don't put all the onus and the pressure on one parent. Don't say, well, mama's the spiritual one, so I'm going to let her handle the work. Or daddy's the spiritual one, so I'm going to let him handle the work. Husband and wife are supposed to work together. That's why God put them together. Amen. To raise families that love Him. Children are a great and awesome responsibility. And we must appreciate the privilege of the experience. Amen. We live in a society that has devalued human life. Abort, we kill millions of of children every year in the name of convenience. Amen. Their lives are not valuable. They're not appreciated. Being a parent, being a father and a mother is not understood or appreciated what that means. That's the old adage. Anyone can be a father, but not everyone can be a dad. Amen. Any guy can be a father biologically, but not any man can be a dad. They got to take it seriously. For the care, the well-being of their children. But we've devalued children. That in some families are nothing more than money makers. In some families nothing more than getting more benefits. We have devalued our children. And we wonder why they don't value themselves. Amen. We wonder why they walk into our homes and they don't value themselves and why girls throw themselves at guys who don't care about them or love them but whisper sweet nothings in their ear and promise them how pretty they are and use them and throw them away. They are seeking value outside of God and their mom and their dad because they have not been taught the importance of valuing themselves. Amen. Parents have not taught them how important they are to God. They've taken the responsibility lightly. Then they do not value their children, so their children do not value themselves. And the cycle of rebelliousness and disrespectfulness and suffering continues throughout their lives because they will then raise children that have no value. And they will raise children that do not value themselves. And so on and so forth. Only God, however, can break that cycle. Children are not showpieces to be dressed up, to brag to your friends about and ignore at home. Amen. Our children are, are people that we're supposed to as adults live vicariously through and do everything through that we felt like we were shortchanged as when we were kids. Amen. Yeah. Our children are not showpieces to be trotted out like dogs at a dog show. Our children are not toys for entertainment. Your children are not there solely for our enjoyment and entertainment. They are mind, body, and soul. Yes. They're not like a game that you put in and play when you're ready and then take out and sit on the shelf when you don't feel like dealing with it. Amen. Our children are knickknacks to be put on a shelf and ignored and only looked at every once in a while and dusted on occasion. They are full of inherent potential, value, and purpose. And as parents, we have a responsibility to develop that potential, recognize their value, and point them towards God. It is a grave responsibility. It is why Jesus said, if you cause a child to stumble and fall away, it is better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and jump in the river. We have a responsibility to love our children. There's going to be a lot of people who stand before God, who think they had it all together. A lot of pastors are going to stand before God and answer for their children. Amen. They were married to their jobs. or the, They were married to the position. Or they were married to doing the Lord's work. And they forgot their families. Amen. 
One day they will answer to God for that. Not a perfect parent, not trying to say that I am. For the first several years of my kid's life, I was never home. I saw my kids about an hour at night because I was working all day and I went to school at night. For the first years of their lives, I was never home. I'm not the ideal parent. I made lots of bad mistakes, but I will tell you this. I pray for my kids so that God will protect them even though I make mistakes. I strive to teach them a fear and a knowledge of God and to live that in front of them. I've made mistakes and I've definitely screwed up on more than one occasion. So I'm not trying to say that I'm perfect. I'm trying to, to point out the importance of our kids and the sight of God and the importance of our role in their lives. Proverbs 22, 6 says, and this is something that is quoted on a regular basis in our churches. Train up a child in the ways that he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we always quote that in a positive light. And that's, it's meant to be in a positive light. Train your kids up in a fear and a knowledge of God, and though they may run and rebel, they will come back to what they know. But in the same respect, well, if we train a kid up to be disrespectful, to disrespect God and those in authority over them, it will permeate their lives for the rest of their lives. Amen. Unless God intervenes. So just as that principle holds true in a positive manner, that principle also holds true in a negative manner. It will permeate their lives and it can destroy them. And it starts at home with the parents. We must seek God's guidance for excellence. Manoah, Samson's father, prayed in verse 8, Oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. Parenting is not easy, and we should recognize that on a daily basis. It is not an easy job. It's not. But God says, I will help you. I will give you guidance and direction if we will simply seek him and ask. There is no parenting manual when you become a parent. Amen. You got to learn. I didn't know what I was doing. Right? I, I didn't inherently know how to be a good dad. I didn't like wake up one morning after he was born and say, oh, look at that. The light bulb just clicked off and suddenly I was like, Mr. Nanny. I, I, I didn't have any of that happen. There's no instruction manual, manual for parenthood. But God created families and he created parents. And he is the guide and the director. If we will seek him, stay close to him, he will guide us and direct us and give us wisdom. Amen. It's in his word and the Holy Spirit will guide us, direct us, and give us discernment if we will seek him. Amen. And last but not least, and this is probably one of the most important things. In fact, long ago I preached a whole sermon on this. We must prepare for our children to leave the nest. Judges 14, 1 and 2 says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. His dad said to him, Now Samson, isn't there a pretty girl in Israel? Samson said, Nope, I want that one. Go get her for me, for she pleases me. Samson was a grown man who had to make manly decisions and he screwed up. <laughs> it was not his parents' fault that he made bad decisions. It was their son's fault. Parents so often do the best that they can. They seek God and their kids still make bad mistakes. It is not your fault when your kids make mistakes. If you have raised them in a fair knowledge of God, you have taught them to love God, it is not your fault. You don't have to live the guilt with bad mistakes that your children make because they're adults and they have to make their own choices. Your kids are going to mess up. They're going to dabble in the world. It's part of growing up. 
as part of them learning. They're going to think they know everything. I have two of them right now that think they know everything. So your children are going to make mistakes. They're going to screw up. They're going to make bad choices. But it is not our fault and we cannot control them in every decision that they make. And I am learning that lesson right now the hard way. Sometimes I want to pick up my son by the shirt collar and shake him. Because I don't want him to experience the pain that I experienced. I don't want him to make the same mistakes that I made. I don't want my kids to make the same mistakes that I made. I don't want them to experience the same things that I experienced when I made poor decisions. I want to protect them. But it is my poor decisions that made me into the man that stands before you today. It is those bad choices that we learn from and the good choices that we learn from so that we learn. It's like touching the stove. Mom and dad can tell us a million times, don't touch the stove. But until I touch the stove and realize why I shouldn't touch the stove, I don't want to touch it. Until I touch it and I'm burned, I don't appreciate the power of the stove even though mom told me not to. I can't understand the consequences until I experience them myself. Amen. So when our kids make bad decisions, when they know, when they do things they know are wrong in spite of how you've raised them, we must trust God that He will protect them he will keep them, and then it will turn back to him. Amen. Our kids will make their own choices, and all we can do as parents is to spend their years that we can encourage them and teach them the best that we can to love God, and then allow God to handle the rest. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope that you enjoyed it and were blessed by it. Each month we have people from all over the world who listen to the messages made available. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you consider making a donation of any amount to help support us as we continue to reach a loss for Christ? Donations can be made online at www.reviveoc.org or by check at Revive Outreach Church, 411 Chatham Heights Road, Suite 101, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22405. Thank you for your prayers and your continued support. May God richly bless you.